Good evening, everyone. Oops, my voice is really scratchy. I, it's, like, it's just not even there. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Poetry Center um, on this beautiful night. Um, this is the first time I've been in the Ruble Room after over two years. So this is a very big event. So I just want to give a round warm <laughs> of applause to all of us for just coming together again in community here tonight. Um, it's been a lot of tough times, but I'm happy to be here with you all in Tucson. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the literary director here, and um, I'm honored tonight to host poets Carl Markham and Lorianne Guerrero as part of our um, reading and lecture series. I just have a few things before we begin, uh, just so that you know kind of how the night will go. Um, I want to remind everyone that um, our next reading will occur on Thursday, December 2nd, and we'll be hosting Jericho Brown. So please come out for that. That's going to be a really beautiful event. Um, I also want to share with everyone that tonight's event is a co-reading, um, and we, what, part of the co-reading is that it is a Tom Sanders memorial reading. And I just want to share a few things about what, who, who Tom Sanders was. and. Um, you know, just so that you'll have an idea about that. Um, so uh, it was established by the generosity of Tom's friends in 2017, and this event features writers who were former students at the University of Arizona, writers who were formerly or currently members of the University of Arizona faculty, or University of Arizona press authors. So Carl Markham um, is an alum of the UA uh, Creative Writing Program. He actually studied with Allison Deming. So he's here on behalf of that to honor the memory of Tom Sanders. And if you'd like to read more about Tom Sanders, please go to our website. We have a lot of uh, just uh, information about his life and just his spirit and how generous he was. Um, we're going, the reading order is going to be um, Adela Lincona introducing Lorianne Guerrero. And then we'll have Allison Deming come up and introduce Carl Markham. And before I bring up, um, before I, I'm sorry, before I bring up Adela, I just want to say a few words about Adela and then also Allison, just so you guys know just who is introducing who, because it's just such an honor because we have so many badasses on stage tonight that it's like I'm trying to like navigate all this badass stuff here to share with you so you know who it is that's in the house. Um, so just a few words about Adela Lincona. Um, Adela Lincona is basically the, the visionary behind the Art for Change Agency, which serves and supports critical voices and creative visions working individually and through academic, grassroots, and other organizational engagements and affiliations for social change. Um, this uh, agency started uh, in an attempt to support and promote just, meaningful, and joyful ways of working. Um, Adela brings decades of experience in higher education, feminist and intersectional leadership, community organizing, creative collaboration, and the arts uh, to uh, academics and creative writers, artists, and activists. So that is just a shortened bio, but if you also want to know more, head to her website, The Art of Change Agency, and you will know more, and maybe you could even work with Adela if you are lucky enough, because um, we're currently working with her, and it's just been an honor. So that's Adela. Um, the other person I want to say a few words about uh, before Adela comes up and introduces Lorian Guerrero is um, about Alison Hawthorne Deming, um, who grew up in Connecticut. And if you have not already picked it up, her new nonfiction book, A Woven World, on fashioned fishermen and the sardine dress, uh, which was published by Counterpoint Press in 2021. So if you don't have that book, you should get that book. That's another amazing thing that you want to make sure that you pick up. Her other books of her poetry, she has many, uh, is uh, 2016 Stairway to Heaven and Death Valley Painted Light, which is a collaboration, actually, with photographer Stephen Strom. She has an essay collection, Zoologies on Animals and the Human Spirit, which was published in 2014. Uh, she's a Guggenheim Fellow, the author of Science and Other Poems, winner of the Walt Whitman Award from the Academy of American Poets, and a whole bunch of other amazing things. So I'll just stop there. But anyway, just we need to recognize that. Um, before Adela comes up, I would just like to say, um, please buy books. We've had a long hiatus. 
this is something really special for us to come together, and it's really great to be able to meet the author and to have them here in person. And um, Carl Markham's most recent book is A Camera Obscura. So I brought that up so you could see it. It's right over here. Um, and then Lorianne Guerrero has a series of selected poems uh, as part of the TCU Texas Poet Laureate series. And this is a really beautiful red hardback book. It kind of looks like the Bible or something. It just looks very, very official. I think Carl Jung's red book, it's similar to that color. But anyway, um, please buy books. Um, and I'll leave it to Adela now. Thank you, everyone. Buenas noches. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be here on this inaugural you know, return, I guess. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to Tyler, Paola, and Diana. In fact, to all the Poetry Center and any university staff whose labor is invisible to us here tonight, but whose work also went into making this evening special for us. I'm especially grateful to Diana, whose inv invitation um, gave me the opportunity, gifted me the opportunity to immerse myself in Laurie Ann Guerrero's words. Her poetry, essays, and her readings, lyrical rootings in place, over and across time. She's a lover of words, a kind of geo-choreographer who, in dancing on the page and on the stage, moves us over cultural landscapes and timescapes and territories of the heart, everyday histories and history makers. She's elegantly attentive to the elements, the elemental. She is, as so many of you know, a poet, a gorgeous poet. She is also a grace-giving pedagogue whose pedagogy is an homenaje to traditional home knowledges and our antepasados, our elders, including the trees. Hers is a, a pedagogy inflected with the spirit of those fierce feminists and women of color mujeristas who have long called us to claim our education, an inspiration for all who teach, and especially for those of us who are called to teach at a land-grant institution, an Hispanic-serving institution on unceded indigenous territories, she encourages her writing students to understand that they're not here to receive their education. No, she says, rather build upon the lessons distilled through generations to give their own inherent knowing in return in the name of something far greater. For her, education seems to imply a reciprocal relationship. There's hope in her pedagogy and a deep abiding respect these words I've shared with you are from her poem, Between the Soil and the Sun, where she also writes, it's the history in your hands. This line suggests each student arrives with something to offer, and whatever they hold on to from their educational experience will be added to what they arrived with, which to her is never nothing. Recognizing the history in your hands is another way to honor our abuelitos, our abuelitas as the makers, the holders of history, historical actors in and from our own homes, our comunidades. This poem appears alongside two other poems whose authors are first generation students, zine writers, new poets. This is another mark of Laurie's work expansive and elegant. She shares space, she makes space through her words and her actions for the emergent, the everlasting, and the everyday. Her poetry highlights tracings from the past that linger imperceptibly sometimes, but she reminds us that's with us still. She says, be ready to cough up songs, corridos plucked first by a revolutionary whose gun smoke you wear in your hair. Such sensual imagery. She writes of the spoken and sometimes unspoken but ever-present lingering wisdom of our antepasados. You hear that so clearly in her words, the grandmothers know what the trees know, but they're not speaking either. Her work makes place-based meaning. It probes the contradictions of different memorializations. In How to Sacrifice Your Son, she writes, kiss the tiny fingers he'll wrap around triggers made for killing boys. 
These words connected to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, untethered, float as admonitions for this moment too. She notes in part four of Stealing the Crown Sonnet as Reconciliation that by writing, she learns who she is. I believe in her reading, in, in us reading her work, we can get closer to who we are. It's a pleasure, a delight, an honor to introduce Lorian Guerrero to you tonight. Born and raised in the south side of San Antonio, she's the author of Babies Under the Skin, A Tongue in the Mouth of the Dying, A Crown for Gumecindo, a collaboration with visual artist Maceo Montoya, and I Have Eaten the Rattlesnake. She holds a BA in English Language and Literature from Smith College and an MFA in Poetry from Drew University. She's an associate professor and the writer in residence at Texas A&M San Antonio. In 2014, she was appointed Poet Laureate in the city of San Antonio by former Mayor Julian Castro. She was shortly after appointed uh, Poet Laureate of the state of Texas. Um, and I'm, I'm sad that Diana stole this from me. Maybe I stole it from her. I don't, I, it, you, we'll have to battle that out sometime. But Lorianne Guerrero is in two words, badass. Please join me in welcoming Lorianne. I just want to let it keep talking. <laughs> I just, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what an honor for that, um, to, to be here with y'all, um, for the invitation, Diana, to be reading with Carl, an old friend. Um, it is such, this is such a beautiful space. Tucson is such a beautiful city. I'm so honored to be here. Um, I'm a little choked up. Like, I just, that was a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read from my latest collection. This is part of the poet, the Texas Poet Laureate series, and, and um, it's a collection of new and selected. And so I'm going to read a little bit from here. But um, I, visit, I visited Claire McLean's class earlier today, and um, uh, I think she asked if I would be reading anything from my new manuscript. And so I brought it with me, and I'm actually working on it. I was editing in the, in the plane, so I didn't want to take it out of order. So I just brought it with me. So I'll read a couple poems from there, too. But. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, a new poem, and uh, it's called Eating the Rat on, on Eating Rattlesnake. I remember it only once. I was small. Maybe it was the one my father shot off the front porch. Maybe it wasn't. The men stood around the fire. The women sat inside. I snaked around the men, hiding myself, slitherer. I have seen it many times, the long stripping, one fist pulling skin, another pulling flesh, and how the kills were celebrated. Rattles and skins hung like tapestries, the innards left to wild things. When it was passed around hot from the fire, the women did not partake. I dug in, rough and curious. There was nothing more unashamed than a rattler. No apology in its tongue. It would never be cute. I had to eat it. I had to know this. Um, I'm going to read one poem from um, my first full collection, uh, which is um, a Tongue in the Mouth of the Dying. Um, and that, no, this poem is called Sundays After Breakfast, A Lesson in Speech. Um, but I was raised um, on, a, on a property um, very south, San Antonio, uh, that was part of the Dionisio Land Grant. <laughs> um, and uh, Gomezindo Martinez uh, Guerrero, my grandfather, whom my second collection was named for, um, is part of the Martinez of the Martinez, right? So. Um, anyway, Sundays after breakfast, after we would eat our barracoa, you all have barracoa here, right? Yeah, okay, so we would have our barracoa and big red. You don't have that here, that's soda that we have in Texas. <laughs> barracoa and big red, but after we would have our, our barracoa and big red, we would sit on the porch and grandpa would tell stories. Um, and so those, I have a couple of poems called Sundays After Breakfast. This one's a lesson in speech. There were no names for men like that. 
Gringos who stitched up their rules, their white garb, laced snug the issues of the day. Lord didn't make us to mix with them folk, they said. But God's got nothing to do with the black boys dumped still alive into a restless river. God's got nothing to do with having to tell their mamas. That bloody water ran through each dark vein across Texas, fed the Gulf, all its brown-skinned people. This grandpa could name, Los Cuerpos, bodies swaying above the cotton like sheets on a line. No importaba que no eras negro, pero que no eras gringo. No, it didn't matter that you weren't black, grandpa says, pushing himself from the table, but that you weren't white. He lived his life this way, silent, like every man after him, opening his mouth only to eat, holding his head above the cotton between white men and black boys. So my um, second collection, or my third collection, um, A Crown for Gomezindo, uh, is a heroic crown of sonnets that I wrote after my grandfather passed. Now, I grew up with him. We, we lived on the same property. He passed in uh, 2013. And I spent the next year and a half working on this heroic crown of sonnets for him. And for those who don't know, um, a heroic crown of sonnets is a series of 15 sonnets. And there's lots of rules, but you know, screw the rules. <laughs> so, so, but ideally for me anyway, uh, the last line of the first sonnet starts the second, the last line of the second starts the third and so on, right? Until it forms a, a crown. The, the, the 15th sonnet is comprised of the first line of the previous 14. I'm only gonna read a couple from here, but this one is called Newborns. And this, like I said, this was after my grandfather's passing. Newborns. Let's look at our reflections in the mud. See how in four months each of us has changed. What is your name without a body? My name without you here. I am you, what I never was. Suddenly I carry my newborn grief like a new mother. I nurse and swaddle my most fragile, my newest, my sweet. What festers in the bellies of strangers does not concern me. There is only this. I am the only mother. Mine is the only child. I decompose alongside you, wanting and not wanting everyone to see me, off balanced and leaking my skin in strands, the oddity that was put in my hands. Dia de los Muertos. The oddity that was put in my hands, your truck. It used to be I drove this road each week to pick you up. Now I drive this road each week to lay you down again. Today is the day of the dead. When did you die? Today I bring you chicharrón con huevo, chile, which is to say I brought breakfast to the goats. I want to slip my hand into the photo of you. Fix your hair as I did, help you with your sweater, guide heavy salt to your plate. Grass is starting to grow over you. Shards of rock gone smooth, I sing to bees. I lay my ear to stone, it doesn't hurt. I hear your song, water rising from dirt. I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, this one's called Casketing. I've buried everything I've ever loved in the bone of reason. Now, even in dreams, you are dead. Sometimes I wheel your metal-colored coffin to the grocery store, once to a papery, twice to Fiesta Bakery on Pleasanton. You are heavy. Once I was in high school in a play and parked you stage left. Always I shake you, wake up, damn you. Sometimes the casket is open and I kick you. And when in my small shoes I make contact, your ribs crumble like the bark of an old mesquite. Wake up, wake up. We can't run the numbers. 
argue, make your mother's bread if you are always going to be dead. Untouchable. If you are always going to be dead, who then will melt away the breasts from my chest? Need more my eyes than the unraveling of my hips. In your house, I was all bedrock and teeth, cutthroat, stopped clock, just as much man as woman, or rain. You were blind and I loved you for it. In your house, my shoulders grew to fit the work. Patience blossomed upon my head, a crown. You were my mirror, my name, ready plumb of my right hand, my ancient and rivered neck, my compass, my wing, my open gate, my warrior, my sleepless legion, as if I had been born male. My kingdom come, and one day in hot July, my kingdom gone. So those are from A Crown for Gumesindo. Um, this next poem was actually commissioned from my city uh, when I was poet laureate of this city. And um, it's called Ars Politica. And I wrote it because uh, when I was poet laureate of the city, one of the questions I got often was, um, how do you do it? How do you, like, how do you write poems? How do you, how do you make poems? <laughs> and I was like, man, <sighs> like I need a whole lifetime, right, to explain that to you. Uh, but this was my response to that question, right? Ars Politica, how to make art in praise of the working artists of San Antonio. You must start small as our mothers were small, our fathers too, small in a pillowcase whip-stitched with roses or in an old coffee can, collect your abuelo's teeth. Assure them you will not bury them near the bones of the dog that froze the winter that dogs froze. Carry the teeth under your tongue. Let them root there. This is how you will learn to speak. Be ready to cough up songs. Corridos plucked first by a revolutionary whose gun smoke you wear in your hair. The songs will be new in your throat. We are always beginning. We are always beginning again. You cannot be afraid to unhinge the jaw. Let the sun blister your mouth. No thirst. Cast your own eyes from their sockets like a confettied April that you will know the bloom and battle of flowers. Let your ribs draw across the ribs of another, el canto del violin. Let your fingers dance, el guitarrón. Needle or pen, brushed oil, machete or drum, leather, cilantro, stomp, be patient in the tooling. The weaving of experience, 100, 500, 10,000 years to hear, love making in the cotton and nopal, battle lines and color lines, birthing in the huts, in the casitas, under a grove of mesquite and huizache, and two, lynchings and genocide in the feathery strands of our DNA that move our hands to do the work. Trust your hands know the work, even if you do not know the work. You do not speak for the dead. The dead speak for you. Um, this next one. Um, so I have three babies. They're not babies. They're old and stinky. <laughs> My baby is 16. She's a junior in high school. I also have a 20-year-old who's a student at UT in Austin. And my son is a college graduate, I'm very happy to say. <laughs> uh, and he lives off on his own. Um, but when my son uh, got accepted to school in New York City, and we're from the south side of San Antonio, uh, it hit me really hard that this was right and this was good. And I'm glad that I, 
had the sense to let him dream and to follow his what he needed to do. Um, and it didn't hit me until a week after he'd gone that, that my baby is in New York City. <laughs> um, and I realized that I had been preparing for this day for so long. Um, and I, I wrote this poem a week after he left. It's called The Blessing. I have ignored you for a year. I have not dwelt on the soft fur of your arms or the way you rubbed my cheek with your own starry cheek. I splintered your hands away from my heart when you exited me. Of the men who have claimed my body, only you reflect my exact goodness, tragic as a cotton field ripe with bloom. But I have not dwelt on this either, not in one year or three. The way you break open your own throat, singing, sculpting one world, another, or kiss a girl in my kitchen, calling her my love, my love. No, I have ignored you for a year, or six maybe, not touching your feet or your shoulders to dab them dry, not humming in your ear as I did once, not holding your head against my chest in the sad night. I have not dwelt on other women who speak sweetly to you, laugh with you, or hold your head against their chest in the sad night. I have ignored you for a year or 10, finally severing the root, purging, drying out the heart. Go. So I'm gonna uh, read two poems from the new manuscript and then I have the last one will be from here. So this is, um, I hope I don't mess up this order. This is from the new manuscript. Um, it's called Red Work and it's a collection of poems um, and little essays and also visual um, poems. I don't know if you can, let me see, if I can show one. So I've got a lot of um, embroidery work in this one. It's, it's a big piece, but this is just a copy of the, the embroidery work. So all the embroidery work is done in red. And, uh, and so this is just one of the pieces. Um, the new book is called Red Work. The new manuscript's not a book yet. But this is one of the poems from there. It's called Anatomy of Fire. The last time I shot a gun was the night my father told me he should have killed my mother when he had the chance. I bury my father that night, write the last poem for him, leave it burning where he lay. We do not leave each other. Here is the tiny pulsing gene dancing in his blood as genes do. It does not question itself. He does not question himself. Warrior, weapon, battlefield. I have inherited my father, firing pen, pin caught in my throat or in the tips of my fingers, and the only thing between me and fire is this skin that cannot hide its triggers. I need not hold a gun to your head. I need only touch my own face. And this one is called, I've never read this one out loud. <laughs> anyway, I hope my kids aren't watching. <laughs> Sorry, kids. Uh, uh, this one's called One. <laughs> there were nights I told myself drinking Jack was safer than sucking one off. One would never consume me, the other I couldn't be sure. I had given myself already to a man who hadn't fathered my children. When he came inside me, he never left. I could not risk it. Maybe I was more frightened than I had let on, not of disease or rumor or even shame, but of removing one boot, then another, a shirt, both legs from my jeans, bobby pins and earrings, this bearing ritual, the turning of skin inside out, fingers and eyes where there should be no fingers, no eyes. I have built a covenant with myself. Even drunk, I could calculate the safety of one. I could count. I could count on that. So those are from the new book. 
And uh, I'm going to close up with um, is that a train? I love this. I love that. I grew up next to a train. It just it's very centering to me. Um, this is the last one in this book. Um, and this is the one where I got the title for the book. This one's called The Plight of Lovers. You came to my body in my wildest grief, drunk in it. I welcomed you. There were catastrophes I needed to explore. You contained them all. When you lap the well of my blood, milky and flowing near the river and sugarcane fields, you drink too, my mother and hers, the lovers each they had. This is the dowry. This is the lot. The only child I will give you is myself. Be worthy. I have eaten the rattlesnake. Thank you all very much for having me. Thank you for that profound and powerful badass reading. So, I have a distinct pleasure tonight in introducing Carl Markham. Carl was my student in his first poetry class at the University of Arizona, an intro to poetry class. Carl knew he was a poet. I, as his teacher, was not convinced. <laughs> he came to understand that. And I think I was a bit hard on him. However, I now know he's a poet, and a brilliant poet. And he taught me, through the long years that I've known him, that the unfolding of artistic talent is in itself a beautiful mystery. And I have taken such pleasure in watching that talent unfold in Carl. Carl Markham is a Chicano poet from Tucson. He's the author of the collection Q Lazarus from the University of Arizona Press in 2001. He has not been in a rush to publish his second book, and that may be why this second book is such a fabulous book. His poems have appeared in anthologies, uh, The Wind Shifts, New Latino Poetry and Latinx Rising, an anthology of Latinx science fiction and fantasy, he earned his MFA from the University of Arizona. He won a Wallace Stegner Fellowship at Stanford. And he's also had fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Illinois Arts Council, and the Taos Writers Conference. He had a Conte Mundo Fellowship. And he taught for many years at DePaul University in Chicago and now lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with his beautiful wife and three children. Carl Markham takes inspiration in a camera obscura from the gravity of living on Earth to the extremity of contemplating the stars, finding that in our very evanescence comes our savoring of the moment. He somehow manages to create connective tissue between the cosmic and psychic, the pillars of both Nebulae and Monument Valley, all the while balancing on the page the complexity of Chicano identity in the borderlands, claiming his place in places that may not have wanted him. If you always make this landscape interior, you will never feel displaced. In the quietly titled poem, Further Reflections from the Art Institute, one of his bravest poems, he writes his way into imaginative identification with Shipe Totec, the flayed one, the Aztec god of regeneration and warfare who flayed himself in order to feed people and for whom sacrificial victims were flayed. 
Markham can be witty, too. I celebrated my birthday on a science rig surveying a binary system. His science smart reflections on images gleaned by the Hubble telescope are, well, they're a kind of lens at the center of the book, and they are stellar. The reach of the book is gorgeous, all attended to with an appetite for language that seems itself a kind of soul hunger. Take a word list from one of his Blind Contours Night Sky poems, Microchips, Vulpecula, the Fox constellation, Sodium Lights, Firmament, Sunroof, Trickster, Trixie, Vixen, the smolder and spark of Chicago cityscape, deconstructing the word cute, the Drake equation ending in Fermi's paradox, the star called Ojo de Dios, all seek to unite the mind with the unknown in these fine and engaging poems. I'll end with his words because they're beautiful. He writes, we begin in division, cell into cell into cell, the warring systemic mass of us, staggering, persistent, and excited into our own blunt senses. I am so honored and pleased to introduce to you the poet, Carl Markham. Buenas tardes, Luxon. It's good to be home. I grew up here, uh, and then I left. And now all I want to do is come back. But uh, you know what they say, you got to go where the work is, right? Uh, this guy uh, wrote some poems that I'll read to you later, but I'm going to read to you some poems from the new book. Uh, for those of you who under, don't understand Spanish, pues que lastima. <laughs> Cartografía de noche. Aquí está la luna nueva y llena de la misma vez. Y de este momento siguen otros momentos. Y si sigues las luces plateadas, puede ser que llegarás Aquí. Blind Contour, Night Sky, number one. Tonight, the heavens murmur their promise, a bright and distant violence. And you've driven a switchback road out past jagged small mountains that border west this small and jagged town where your heart's consecutive failures have been as carefully coded as the codex of stars that fold in, out, in, out, and tuck away in your breast pocket. Because tonight you hate yourself for being lonely, recline against hood and windshield, dark and parked, and gazing, because this is all you know, because you misbelieve, because you mistake yourself for ancient vision unveiled by Sawaro's yearning skyward, arms beckoning the gauzy ribbon of dust and stars until the headlights fade from your eyes' edges. But you're still left dark and wandering Apogee begins to focus. Beetlejuice, Rigel, arm and leg of Orion, his belt, those diamond seams. And you forget why it is he stalks the skies. Draw your eyes back. See the night for all her breath when coyotes ring their pale and petty argument. And catch now, peripherally, a streaking light, an acute and failing angle earthward, all atmosphere in friction, a brilliant production. A meteor, you know, milliseconds away from smoldering it. And because it may amount to nothing, a quintessence of dust, cast your well-worn wish. 
gets sweaty under the mask. Uh, tonight is uh, the Torrid meteor shower. It's peaking, and then next week is uh, the other part of the Torrid meteor shower. So if you want to read this poem again and drive out Gates Pass into the monument and look up into the skies, you have that opportunity. This poem is called uh, A Science Fiction, um, mostly because someone once told me, oh, poets can't write science fiction. And I said, yes, we can. A Science Fiction for Ursula K. Le Guin. When the sun rose, it was smaller than in my dream. I had been asleep for what felt a long time and woke confused and claustrophobic. The texture of sky still magnetized me, a desert bright day. But the light is streaked like too much everything pulled to the edges of a window in storm. What little of me exists as aperture. I wanted so little for my birthday, a moment's peace on a hill. And where did that get me into the stars themselves to hitch myself to a salvage run 13 years round trip? A distress signal, a freighter the company had written off the summer I learned to kiss a girl until she shook with desire. When the engines fired, no one thought to think could even know this uncharted singularity. At night on earth, I am all of Orion. At night on earth, I fell tangential into a puddle of cold rain and rippled the muddy reflection of new Chicago, blurred its confusion into circuit and solder. This is what I can expect. Gravity, density, volume dissipating. I am all at once. I studied all night for an exam I wouldn't pass, slept through a snowfall that piled itself upon itself. Death isn't the door you would expect, isn't a carriage kindly stopping. I celebrated my birthday on a science rig, surveying a binary system. The galley scrounged up cake and candle. I wished myself into consciousness. Proximity alarms should be blaring, but sound is stretched to color, color stitched to light, light solidifying to absence, absent the sequence. So that poem plays with the idea of uh, what it might be, you know, Stephen Hawking theorized about it, several so other. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson about what might happen if a human being were ever pulled into a black hole. So. I play around with their ideas in that piece. Uh, the center of this collection is a, a series of meditations on Hubble telescope image, images, where I approach them from an ekphrastic point of view. That's when uh, a poet uses a detailed description, according to the Norton Anthology of Poetry, uh, to examine a visual work. Uh, there they mean artwork for the most part, but uh, the work that Hubble has done for us over the last 20 plus years, has given us a, a glimpse of the heavens that uh, no one had ever imagined. This f f next poem is uh, based on the Horsehead Nebula. Number two, the Horsehead Nebula. A horse is a thing of such beauty, none will tire of looking at him, so long as he displays himself in all his splendor. The Greek historian Xenophon. Imprinted like a glyph in our minds, a pattern born in trance, the dream of momentum rendered against the sensory void of darkness, pulled into the earthen cold caves of Lascaux and Chauvet, where shamans ordered their animal visions against stone walls. Imagine that erratum of prehistory, a carved ivory tusk worn smooth with worry, the Vogelhead horse 
held close as the tribal spears stalk a herd of dun ponies to spook, stampede toward the hungry luck of gravity and cliff. Imagine the first dim soul sensing his, the absence of a horse's back, begging for his form. The scamper astride an unwitting beast, the terror and shock, a ruined stalk, frenzy breaks full gallop across the steps. That moment, horse and rider, tangle of hair and hide, thigh and quarter clench, seismic blurred landscape, thunder and dust, ecrine perfume, lather and panic. In that exchange, two species intertwine irrecoverably, a new knot in the strings of theory. And Ryder is thrown a day's walk away into a new lack he cannot fill. In the old story, the king's son turns the white starred hair head of an unbroken beast toward the sun soothes him with whispers, elides his shadow. This familiar silhouette, this dearest coincidence, so distilled through mirrors and software that these strange physics cannot help their own resemblance. Astral red fire, the backdrop of cosmos, each star a neuron firing horse Queen's Gambit, Black Steed, Bucephalus, bound toward eternity. I'm not going to read you all of the Hubble pieces, but they're over there if you want to investigate them further. This is another one called Pillars of Creation. Uh, this is a, the Eagle Nebula, and in the Eagle Nebula, there are these great plumes of gas that look like Monument Valley if you've ever visited. So uh, we, we recognize things of our own experience when we look at, at, uh, at these deep space images that have no intent of mirroring the things that we mirror upon them. Pillars of creation. The patterns of becoming encoded in interstellar gas, our echo of destruction, time lapse, and aftermath. Pillars of star birth, fused to slow hand and spire of monument valley, those cleaved precarious strata riding, rising from the dust of silt stone oxidized, the sunset streaked furious beyond. Or these pillars are the silver nitrate preservation, charred vestige of conflagration, the jagged cinders of Chicago's stone and construct when chaos consumed all that would feed and flash the fire's dervish. Understanding is rote superimposition. Images stacked like books in the mess, each edge of embrace each mistake. So this guy wrote some poems a long time ago. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't read some of these. I, I wanted to read some that I had never read in public before. So I'm going to pick these two short poems. This is called Caw and Crow. I'm a crow of a man. Hamlet's last best interpretation, preferring my body the color of absence. Dark, disconnected as a phone line, as a blank shack. Attracted by the sharp, the shiny, chrome and chrome's likeness. The dark reflection of self in small things. Listen. The finish of this lighter doesn't show much else besides the truth. It's a luminous machine and it burns at a simple, exact task. I've taken to skipping Sunday mass. And the buckles on my shoes, the straps remind me of the vows I've vowed against. 
When I write about a man smoking a cigarette, I mean my grandfather's gray wool suit. I mean me, too distracted by the glittered cleavage of stones, by what's been revealed, how it's accrued. Listen, a crow will land in December snow to leave an angel's print, clear and cold as the light between pines. Their throaty calls break the air like flint, strike, and spark. In the cryptic woodcutter's cottage, grandfather serves his penance, splitting wood for fires that will not burn. <laughs> this poem I, I wrote when I was working at the Poetry Center and I had to lecture a freshman class on The Great Gatsby. Unrequited elegy with Gatsby shirts. I know how you wanted her, those billboards of reinvention that crowd the avenue eyesores. I know you were driving. Hot August Sundays are interchangeable from the city to East Egg, the dark ache in an impossible pink suit pining at a window from the tree line. The moonlight whispers something altruistic. I've heard that same whisper crouched low in my teenage Toyota, parked down the street from a girl's house, watching a single lighted room in the too late hours how it smelled like the oil ticking in every engine from here to the east side. The green light at the end of her dock was as close as you dared get. But the self you'd baked from scratch required validation. Once, in my newest incarnation, I was a measure away from telling that girl, I have something to give you. I don't want it anymore. Five years of rehearsal failed me. I balked in that space between breath and kiss because the truth is I might as well have thrown a crumbling brick, love me, scratched across one face in indelible ink right through her window. I should have shattered that winsome torture with the reality of her lips, the violence of her freckles against my cheek. But I couldn't have my threadbare self newly elaborated and finally workable undone by something as difficult as a kiss, five years in its coming. I should have shattered the space between us like an accident. I was a measure away, her waist and hips, the reality of her lips, a tailor ripping the seams in a shirt sleeve. I might have shattered the space between us. I should have thrown that brick. I know how you wanted her. Those your greatest moment, casting your brand new shirts across the bed, how they fell like invention. Sleeves, collars and cuffs, broadcloth and Oxford, every color weave and print, an avalanche of cotton and almost. You hoped she'd pick just one favorite, one you could flip your arms into with a flourish of stiff starch, because in that color, and cut, she would love you. Instead, she cried at all your beautiful shirts. You couldn't know the space between you was already a boot stuck in the estuary past. I imagine floating silver and pneumatic alone across the pool, watching the tawny autumn fall consequently across the water, falling stiff and regal as shirts across a bed. We should both be stoned for our pride and omissions. Uh, I'm gonna read two more from the book and then I'm gonna read you guys a couple from the new manuscript. One of the things I love to teach my students is the etymology or the roots of words because in the study of the roots of words, you begin to understand something about the power of language. 
etymology of cute. Cute, from acute, from the Latin acuere, to sharpen to a point, an angle, as in exhibit A, the perfect nose. which is cute, as in small and well-formed, but not so small as to be peculiar, but rather to be cute and in such to give a face an appropriate idiom. A cute face establishes attractiveness. That is to say, rounded and young, clearly complected, as so as to inspire the desire to mate. Cute, from the old English Cunan, which is cunning, which is to know in a learned way, which is cute in itself. That is to say, you are cute, to know you are cute. Mignon, in French, as in kissing, as in what the cute face elicits from the mouth, and from the French, mignon, minion, favored and mannered, a lover who is insincere too cute, which is keen, which is sharp, and to the point like the daggers elicited from the mouth, cute as in sharp-witted, which is perceptive, which is to say, don't get cute with me. Because A.D. wanted to hear this poem. Further notes from the Art Institute. Zipitotec, carved wood, and human skin, circa 1450. Tonight, dear one, by the waning moon, I will take this jet shard keen with mercy along the seam of your rigorous spine and flay a proficient suit of you for my finery. Dear one, your raw and fecund sinew assures my bounty Another harvest, another generation of hands emptied, hanging like bracelets from my arms. Your handsome face, a better countenance from my high cheeks. I see through the slats of your eyes. I speak incantation and renewal, my tongue aligned along your lips. Do not mourn your blued and sanguined life, elapsing along the groove of this blade. What is driven through the veins turns crimson, adorns the living with promise. Sacrifice preserves order in the universe. I will wear your skin, dear one, among your own people. They will always mistake me for kind. This is a poem for my mother and my sister who are here. First Snow. We'll let TPD do what TPD does, which is not prevent crime. First Snow. November's commotion settles on my shoulders like good fortune. I'm still delighted by the white idea that's begun to fill the city, accumulation and decree specific under my boot. Remember us, mother. You postpartum, sister asleep in another room. I had you to myself again. We stood against the cold and foreign light of the Utah winter window the snow falling hours on end, and my childhood delight with a constant flurry. Our faces reflected in spider-frosted panes, and I could see you fill with sorrow as each astonishing flake tilted through our view. I know now, as the city forgets itself in the chaos and grace of ice, how you yearn south, missing the desert, the way I watch out this window, missing you with each gathering star.
This is a poem that I wrote for my son that is in the Cutthroat Anthology, which is uh, available widely, that is a, a wonderful anthology that captures the voices of so many uh, Chicano and Mexicano writers. Uh, and you should pick it up as soon as you can. Where did it go? There it is. Un miércoles en febrero. The bare elm twisted. Light snow stuttering. What spring promises seems only cruel rumor. The boy asked me, what happened to my forehead? These ashes, I explain, remind me that I believe in something. But I can't recall why that's so anymore. Or why Fridays leave me hollow. I pretend I'm the peddler of hats in the boy's storybook. And I've no money for lunch. I pretend it still means something to deny the flesh. The boy tells me he likes my ashes. And will I share them? I press my forehead to his. Faith is doubt, hijo mio. Remember this. We are dust. We are stars. We are what happened. And what is next? I'm going to read you just a couple of short pieces from the new manuscript, which is about halfway done. Hopefully, this one won't take me 20 years to finish. Uh, one of the things that you should know about this particular piece is uh, Keats's idea of negative capability, which, to sum up in a kind of pedestrian way, is to understand and accept there are things in life that we cannot know, and to be OK with that. Negative capability and the superposition of animate matter. You are certain you've passed this tree before. The ridged bark, the needles, evergreen shush of wind familiar as an ocean you dreamt in, and the stone beach. You're lost, after all, and the sun is more behind clouds each time you gauge north. Or not. Not even a compass would help you identify the lichen that clings to the fur. Not even a simile would put up with you. After all, you're lost and have passed this tree before, haven't you? After all? Needles done as beeswax collecting on the ground. Behind you is the way you came. Ahead seems more the same. Get lost, they prescribe. Find yourself, they lament. Once, when you were a child, you were lost in the woods. Every tree looked exactly like the next. And now is once. And now is again. And the problem with trees is you can't see past them. Knowing, after all, is lost on you. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with uh, uh, the dichos that your abuelitas might have told you. And this is a very short poem that's uh, called Un Poema en Tres Dichos. Ya te conozco, Mosco, is rumored to have begun as Pachuco slang, finding the cop's rat, seeing through the bad deal, knowing already the truth behind the layered lies. Ya te conozco. I already know you. I've already known the venom of recognition. You're caught like a fly in a web of my own fly design, Mosco. The taunting rhyme. I know you. I know you. I know. Two. Más sabe el diablo por viejo que por diablo is what you said to me when I'd been out too late and smelled of cigarettes and booze in the morning. The wisdom of age is always won by living through your own misdeeds. You don't expect I'll listen to some dicho. No tengo juicio. Have some courtesy, have some sympathy, and some taste. Knowledge has always been a fruit worth biting, worth the juice running down my throat my chin. Three, el hombre prevenido vale por dos. You'd say to me and nod, 
forewarned and forearmed. Be prepared, dig the trenches, lay defenses. Militant in its original design, but here it is also about foresight, which is to say the ability to account for contingency. Everything hangs by a thread unraveling like the seconds before the cops and the protesters begin their riots, that dance of broken glass and broken teeth. Careful, I am worth both of you. And this last poem that I'm going to send you off with uh, is called Sci-Fi Coup, which <laughs> I decided to take the form of the haiku its focus on nature, its 575 structure, and I assure you they are all completely accurate. Sci Fi Ku. Eve of chilled stars, the night dark blue, gravity holds my place twirling. The rings of Saturn shimmer, it is said, like white sand and shells. The shore. Venus, Jupiter, dance like forlorn lovers, each bright burl pining. Asteroids are hurtling in their field, unlucky leftovers, poor rocks, telescopic eyes, and such enormity, so little light squeaks through. Robots venture where we can't. Do servos were where there is no sound? Earth rise. Now we see how we are seen. Enviable blue world. So small. When stars explode, they color clouds that look like crabs, even if they don't. Starship Enterprise. Its continuing mission so boldly going. Beam me up, Scotty. Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor. Live long and prosper. Some neuron sta neutron stars pulse accurately as atomic clocks, a heartbeat. Gauzy ribbon, our own galaxy, spilled milk sky. We are but an arm. We should be a space-faring people, if only to leave and come back. Thank you, Tucson. Thank you, Poetry Center. Thank you, Lorian. It has been my distinct pleasure. I forgot to say that they're here to sign the books. So just we'll be signing books over here. If you're interested, they're selling books. And the poets will stay behind just to sign your book and if you wanted to just also meet them. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you Thursday, December 2nd. Jericho Brown, um, just come back. And uh, thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>